Hello, everyone, and thank you for being here. Welcome to the second webinar from Vivid Voices. This one is titled, You Can't Get There From Here. And we're so excited and honored to have here with us today, Richard Saul Werman, architect, writer of over 90 books, graphic designer, conference creator, father of information architecture, and the founder of TED Talks, TED Med, the World Wide Web Conference, and too many more accomplishments than we have time here to state. In the words of Richard Saul Werman, the fundamental failure of graphic product, architectural, and even urban design is its insistence on serving the God of looking good rather than the God of being good. He also said, perhaps the three principles closest to his heart and the most radical are learning to accept your ignorance, paying more attention to the question than to the answer, and never being afraid to go in an opposite direction to find a solution. Welcome, Mr. Worman. Thank you so much for being here with us today. And returning for his second webinar with us, one of our favorite thought leaders from Western Michigan, Dan Klein. <laughs> I've known Dan since 2005 when I had the honor of placing him in his first IA role. He'll tell you he's a humble Western Michigan guy, but I'm here to tell you that he's the kind of creative that brings great minds like Richard Saul Worman and his own to the moment and forward blazing new paths for information architecture and user experience design. Dan's been the curator of Mr. Werman's work for about a decade, preserving, archiving, and nurturing the volumes of Mr. Werman's accomplishments. Dan is also the co-founder of The Understanding Group, an IA consultancy with offices in Michigan and clients all over the world. Dan, thanks so much for being here again. You're welcome, thank you. You're welcome. And I'm Laura Hunter, and I'm the owner of Vivid Resources. We're a user experience recruiting firm, and we've specialized in helping wonderful companies find amazing UX talent across the nation since 2004. We started Vivid Voices as a way to connect more with the people we serve. Our goal is to inspire big conversations across modalities of design and to support the user experience community with featured thought leaders like our guests today. So please, reach out. Let's work together and fill your staffing needs for user experience. And in the meantime, just a little bit of business. Today, we're raffling off some exciting items. One lucky winner is gonna receive a copy of Mr. Worman's latest book, Mortality. And three lucky winners will receive Information Architecture for the Web and Beyond, fourth edition, a polar bear book, compliments of UXPALA, and its president, Marcella Masirian, who's our esteemed producer. Uh, we will announce the raffle winners today at the end of the webinar, and we'll be sending out a little poll also toward the end. So if you would, please fill that out so we can continue to improve our programming for you. We also have Q&A time audience. So uh, just type your questions in the Zoom chat window. We'll gather them all, Marcella will, and send them to Dan and Mr. Werman to answer in the last quarter of this webinar. Today's topic, you can't get there from here, is a confirmation excuse me, a conversation on information architecture, innovation, information, and the future of user experience. According to Dan, today's ubiquitous modalities of web browser and iPhone pale in comparison to the information experiences Tedsters marveled at 30 years ago. As far as Richard Saul Warman is concerned, the next modality for interacting with and understanding information is one that we can't get to from here. So how do we get there? In this webinar discussion with Mr. Worman and Dan Klein, we will ask those questions. And now without further ado, Dan Klein and Richard Saul Worman. Take it away, gentlemen. Thank you, Laura. You're welcome. And uh, probably before we get started, Richard, uh, I would like to introduce you a little bit to the audience uh, for the webinar because uh, they are here uh, primarily to see you. There were uh, handfuls of people at the last one, and now there are herds of people at this one. So uh, I think one way to characterize- It sounds like there's goats or something. Not well, it, it could be appropriate. Yeah, I'm so still people. learning about goat questions. You, 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 you taught me to keep my, uh, to choose my words carefully. So these herds of people, uh, the broad thing that they identify under is a term called user experience design. Uh, that is what these folks do. I'm not and sure. 
I, what's happening is you're talking and as you're talking, you're somehow saying Alexa in the middle of your speech or your talk. So my little machine here has gone on three times since you're talking. So I have okay. to sit down and I have to tell Alexa to shut up. Okay. I hope it stays that way. And if it doesn't, I'll have to unplug it. Okay. Well, that's uh, the people on this it's call. It's a sign of our times. Well, Richard, the people on this call are the people who make shit like Alexa. User experience design is this broad thing that all these people uh, gather under as a term. And uh, I thought it was important since you and I have had conversations about websites and iPhones and apps. And uh, you've said, and, and correct me if I'm characterizing what you've said wrong, but you've said that we can't get to what's going to be good for us, the kind of uh, what could be, we can't get to from, from the modalities that we have today. So I, I suspected that Laura could bring a bunch of people who make this stuff together. And I would love to hear you talk with me a little bit about what I just said, if, that's, if that is true for you. And then uh, how, how do we get there? What is innovation when you're trying to get to instead, not the next thing, but something instead of what we have? A couple things to begin. Uh, one, you're looking to your left. That's what comes off on the screen. I don't know if it is that way for the audience, but when you're looking now, you're looking directly at me. But you were looking to the left, and I'm sure you're not using crypt notes. So no. that's a better view because it makes a difference in, when you have a screen in front of you like other people do. Second, in the introduction, it said I, I uh, created uh, TED Talks. I didn't create TED Talks. I created the TED Conference, a subset of which is TED Talks a subset of which is TEDx, a subset of which is TEDmed, a subset of which is many other TED things. There was, uh, so it's just TED, that's all I, that's all I did. Uh, and you can't get here from, uh, from here is, is, is not a blanket statement. It's that uh, one way of moving forward or finding out about new things or improving things is just making things better. That's generally what they do. They keep on coming out with additions to the iPhone. They make cars with either more or less chrome. They make change that occurs. And that's a perfectly reasonable and understandable way of, of what we call progress. Uh, you know, you get silver and it gets corroded or so and you shine it. And there, we can make a lot of progress and in fact, the, the overwhelming amount of, uh, of uh, what we call progress or improvement is just making things, making things better. I don't think that is the breakthroughs in, in how we find things and yeah. how, how we make uh, more seismic steps in the future uh, is you just can't call, put a battery in a car and call that innovation. No, it's a car with a battery. We still have a car. We have a battery. We had electric cars back in 1910. Electric trucks delivered the magazines for, uh, for publishing companies in Philadelphia when I was a kid. So that's not really innovation. Uh, innovation is not just a little step. But it sometimes is a very good way of working on doing things better as I design a book or something. I make things better incrementally through it. I hope the idea of the book itself or, or of doing the book or, or the ways, the, the overall uh, macro ways are really, are hopefully they're the opposite. They're more, they're different kinds of leaps of progress. And that's what I meant by that. Mm -hmm. uh, but many years ago, uh, when just before it, it allowed me to quit the AIGA and quit uh, uh, AGI, AGI was because uh, I had made statements that I said in the in the fairly near future. Um, these are fields that I respect enormously, even though I'm trained in architecture. I think the body of people who are trained in graphic design, what was always called just graphic design, yeah are enormously talented. I mean, amazingly talented. I'm in awe 
of uh, still in all of the great graphic designers and the great illustrators that are they're, they're fantastic. And I said, corporate design programs and movie posters and all those kind, that kind of graphic design is going to go on. It's wonderful. But there's a new thing that's emerging. And I think in the near future, 25%, 50% maybe of all things visual are going to have to do with explaining things, allowing things to be understandable. And they, I was uh, metaphorically laughed at and they <laughs> thought that that was, that was, uh, that wasn't so because the basis of, of our, our awards and rewards in those fields were based really on beautiful things, beautiful graphics. And they were beautiful things and beautiful graphics. So what I was saying was really an anathema to them. Yeah. Uh, and that's when I quit. Many years later, I came back because what I said has come true. And uh, now, what I was talking about was information architecture. Now, that has lots of different definitions with people. And whatever people think it is, it's fine. I'm not leading a movement. So what I think is information architecture, why I created the name was as an indulgence for myself. Uh, what, when people call themselves an information architect, they might just do web design or they might do some diagrams or maps or certain cartography or, or some leading or morphing into some experiential design or et cetera. I created that term because I was an architect and I felt that the architect part of me, as I practiced it and as I learned from Lou Kahn, was a systemic thing. It was the thoughtful doing of work, the thoughtful part of design. It was the thoughtful making of place and space. And much of graphic design, design was fundamentally based on its looks. Yeah. Judged it as you would judge a painting. Um, and of course, many graphic design illustrators today are better than most of the painting today, if you're talking about aesthetics. And it was fundamentally aesthetics. And when they gave out a problem, even in art center, the juries would look at the, the problem in what they thought was information design. They would judge it based on how nice looking the map was, not if it worked. It was still the basis of judgment was aesthetics. And this was on design juries when you were part of the critique of other people's work. Obviously, I didn't pull that out of thin air. Yeah. Yes. So that, that's the different, but I, I'm happy with other things as they go. I'm, a, I'm amazed and in awe of the great designers as they're still doing great design that is aesthetically pleasing or clever or whatever it is. And uh, I, I'm not doing away with anything. I'm, it's just also, I live in a, a world of also. You can do it this way, you can also do it that way. I don't think there's a best way of doing things. There's ways of doing things, some of which I think are slightly better than others, but I don't think anything I've done is the best thing or anything anybody's done is the best thing will be somebody doing it better. And it's also, and you can also change things. It's, it's like open, open policy or open design things or open programs or whatever they call open today. Um, what I, when I said you can't get there from here, there's some problems in order to solve. It's not just adding a battery to a car and calling that innovation. It doesn't change mobility. It doesn't change traffic flow. It doesn't change anything. Uh, I read uh, just a few days ago, they said when you're in it, and I thought it was really clever, it made me think about a number of other things. When you're in a traffic jam, you are the traffic that the things we complain about we're part of. Yeah. But we want to get them away from us and blame the world, blame everything else. Oh, those signs are terrible. Well, it's because we're terrible because we allow signs like that. We're part of each thing we criticize. And so there's room to think of an opposite. You use the word opposite, a favorite, or no, it was in the introduction. Yeah. She could have just said opposite because when I start any problem, I, uh, it's something, it starts because I'm stupid. It starts because I'm curious, I'm ignorant, and I can't find easily 
uh, or sometimes even with using even somewhat difficult ways. I can't, I can't get the answer. I can't make it understandable to myself. It's not that the great washed or the great unwashed doesn't understand it. It's that I don't understand. <laughs> and yep. so that, that hits home. And so I try the exercise of saying, well, if I can't find it easily and it's not understandable to me, there's something for me to do because I don't have a job. Uh, nobody asks me, nobody ever has asked me to do one of my books that I've ever done. Nobody has ever asked me to do a conference. So a lot of my productivity, let's say 90%, not an exact figure, it's a metaphorical figure. Most of my productivity comes from my desire to uh, go down a certain road that maybe is parallel, but often is not parallel to what is already going on. Um, and, uh, and my exercise is to think if there's something good, the opposite of it might also be interesting. And uh, famous scientist, Nobel Prize winner, said that when he had a, a, a profound idea, he was rather filled with his own powers. <laughs> he had a profound idea. He, he felt that the opposite of that profound idea was also profound, or possibly profound, or probably profound. And so often my little self-exercise, because I have nobody to talk to during the day, except when <laughs> I bother you when you're in class or something. Um, uh, I think of things I don't understand, and do they have an opposite? Is there another way in? If you accept that as a possibility, then you can't get there from here, here being just an improvement of things. Yep. Which I already have validated. That is valid. I'm not, you know, snowing on that or raining on that as, as a modus operandi for many, many designers or many statisticians or business people or inventors or whatever. You can just, but when they're, and there's, and, and almost everything is incrementally different, except very few thing, things in our society. You can have a teeny little shack and a bigger shack and then a little house and then a bigger <laughs> house and a fancy house and a mansion and all those kinds of things. Yeah. Uh, incrementally, each part of our life can be incrementally better. But some things can't be incrementally better. For instance, some of the big subjects you can't make incrementally better. It's helpful, but it doesn't, it's not the future. Healthcare, yes, you can keep on inventing drugs and you can keep on building hospitals or ripping down hospitals or, or training doctors better, or you can do things incrementally better, treatment better, diets you think better, come up with things. And then the diet you invented this year is different than next year. You can incrementally do things in medicine. But fundamental change has not occurred. They let you believe that it has occurred, well, since, you know, uh, the year 1400, maybe. But the, 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 we are fed the fact that in the last 100 years, there's been absolutely breakthrough improvements. And yet, I don't believe there's anybody watching this or listening to this that doesn't have a doctor story of some disastrous doctor story, hospital story about them personally, or one of their relatives or one of their good friends. It is a primitive, primitive <laughs> area of our lives. Indeed. And healthcare. It's still very primitive. That we laugh at people who had put leeches on you to draw out the blood only 100 years ago or so. They're going to laugh in 50 years of things we do today. You mean, ha ha, they did that then? Uh, so, you have to accept that and that you can't treat things like safety, which are a big concern of people, uh, by just hiring policemen. That's not, you can't get there from here by just throwing people and money at problems. And often, whatever business you do, whatever business you do for other people in business, the solution is often throwing people and money to solve yeah. problems. 
and not thinking about really moving backwards to find a new beginning. That is the more profound, to use the word I used before, more profound way of looking at the solution to a problem. How to move backwards to find the beginning. There's a fundamental difference between an educational system and a learning system. None of us have been involved in a learning system. You mm -hmm. think the university which has an educational system. We grew up in junior high school, high school, and college taking tests often about subjects we weren't interested in, particularly in high school and junior high school. College, you have more choice. So taking tests about things we weren't interested in, having them marked, and then we forget everything. And then completely forgetting it. Yes. Because we weren't interested in the subject to begin with. That's right. And it didn't come from us having a guide to help us with what we were interested in, what we wanted to learn about. And what we wanted to learn about ultimately connects with a guide to everything else in the world. Whether you were interested in cars or music or exercise or food or design, everything connects to everything if you have a guide through that tree, through that that, that uh, maze or through that uh, labyrinth. And you know, those are two fundamentally different things. A maze has different ways and you can get lost in a maze. You have different options. You can go through it many ways. A labyrinth is just complicated, but there's just a path through. Um, and most people call them by the wrong names. Uh, one by the other and other by, if they haven't mixed up. Um, like lectern and podium. Like, like, like podium and, and lecture. People call the lecture and a podium. Podium is a plinth. That's the stage is a podium. <laughs> the whole stage being raised above the room is a podium and the thing on it is a, is a lecture. I, I did it for years. I called it on for years. I forget if somebody corrected me or I corrected myself, but it got corrected. <laughs> um, so that's what I mean. It's just, thinking about things as a flip thing. It doesn't always work. When it works, it's an ooh-ha moment, and you get things that are quite interesting. And then people think, wow, that was really clever, or that was something. And it's in the same as, it's like a game. You're playing a game with yourself. It's game playing. It's game alternatives. It's playing chess, taking an opposite group of moves to win the game. Opposites come up often in the creative life of people who are truly creative, creative with a capital, capital C. Uh, and uh, so I wallow in that and, and get more credit than I'm due for just discovering that early, that everything was wrong. But basically, yeah. just everything was wrong. Uh, I gave a, uh, a uh, commencement speech at Babson College. It's not a university, it's a college. Um, at the, it's a college of innovation where students have come for a few years from around the world. I think more than half the people are from countries other than the United States. It's quite expensive. And the basic idea of it is if you, if you come up with an idea of a new company, a new thing, and you develop that, and as you develop that, that's your education, that's your track. It's a very interesting notion. Uh, everything you have to do to do that, by doing everything you have to do to develop a company, like to develop your company, everything you would have to do, it touches everything. And it's okay. what about innovation. And I proposed to them that all the testing that got them there was based on what I said. Uh, taking tests was based on their marks on ACT tests or, or SAT tests. Uh, or some test like that that they fill in. And, uh, and they're all about answering questions, filling in the answers to multiple, to multiple choice or something like that. And if they looked at the opposite, how could they develop a test that was coming up with questions? Hmm. That you're given subjects and you're marked on how interesting your questions are about finding out about that subject. 
very difficult to mark. I wouldn't know how you do it. Yeah. If you did it, you would have a much truer sense of who you allowed into your institution because it's the asking of a question that determines those people will float to the top. It's the question always, not the answer. Again, the opposite. Yeah. And then I turned around to the president of that college. I said, this is a college of innovation. Yet I had this black burqa on or whatever. Somebody's going to yell because I use that word, but some black robe on. <laughs> and they played the music they always play. It rings in your head when you hear it at all graduations, right? And you march in. And then there's a few remarks by different people. And then the president reads out the names of each person and they walk up and they're given their thing and they walk down and their parents hear it. And I said, there has to be a more innovative way of doing that. Why don't you commission a new piece of music each year? Or why don't you play a particular kind of music uh, that has to do with innovation or some innovative way of, of what instrument is used? Or, why don't you have a screen with the with the student's picture on it so you can really see them? They're not just like a, the head of a needle or the head of a pin, really. Yeah. Actually, the parents can actually see their child, right? And they can pronounce their own name, and particularly if more than half your students have foreign names, they can really be pronounced correctly. And they wouldn't have to walk up on stage, and it would go quicker, and it wouldn't be so hot wearing those robes. Et cetera, et cetera. Why don't you innovate? Why don't you do something instead of just trying to make it better than last year's, which was the same as the year before? Before. So I'm saying in every single thing you do, I'm just giving you a story. And in that story, you see 10 different things you can do. And in every story is like that. I'm not choosing that because that's a good story of showing innovation. I'm yeah. saying a school about innovation does innovate. Long answer to your question. <laughs> Well, it sounds like one of the innovations that you came up with in that remark when it comes to the opposite of the iPhone and apps and web browsers that we have today, you talked about a guide and it strikes me that... A well, guide instead of a teacher. Well, I, I want to extract that out into a paradigm and, and say that the difference between what we have today, we have a pipe and uh, you can try to drink from that fire hose, that's a popular uh, analogy, and that a guide would mediate between the fire hose to help you understand. And uh, I'm thinking about the things, talking about Muriel Cooper, as you did earlier, uh, the author of that book on the Bauhaus, or the designer of that book on the Bauhaus. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, she showed some things at TED that I have not seen the likes of which since. Uh, her visible language workshop, was that what it was called? Correct. There were, it was flying through information. It was seeing. I named it when she got off. I said, Muriel, that was like flying through information. Then she called it that for the next few months until she died. She died shortly after that single presentation to the public that she ever made. It was put together at TED because they just had the loose pieces. Yep. And, uh, and so the first time she saw it, the first time anybody saw it was at TED. We made a video of it, luckily, and that's the only extant view of that flying through information culmination of her studies with her students at the, at the great media lab. Uh, I say that because it's in the press now. Hmm. Uh, and it is, is, was, will be a great school of learning. Um, the only one I can actually point to. Uh, so she was doing things. She was trying for the other ways of looking at the same thing and seeing it for the first time. And uh, that was that was uh, that was very exciting, very exciting, and uh, continues to be. Uh, and much of what we see in we see it, prolifer it proliferated immediately. Before that presentation, I forget what year, but before that presentation, there was none of the ads for letters move through space or you flew through information or there was titles to movies <laughs> that way. Or there was a whole bunch of things that came out of 
came out of that one presentation of looking at not only X, Y, Z and time, you know, of the, all the coordinates of, of how information could be presented and how you could be immersive within the diagram and immersive in, in it, which was now possible because of what computers could more easily do. And uh, so that, that, was a, that was certainly a breakthrough. Well, it, it, it seems to me that one of the ways that we could characterize that, it's, it's unfair that the audience doesn't know what we're talking about. That was Ted Five, I think it was 1995, Muriel Cooper. And the Z axis, the situating information, textual information in space, and that the Z axis would add understanding to the information by where it was in space. To me, that's one of the more thrilling parts about what she did there. And to me- the immersive, too, the immersive part. The yeah. person in there, you've heard me say that they still have invented a computer that nods. Uh, that's immersive. If, if the computer was nodding, I would feel much more at home with it, that I knew it and understood my instructions or things of that sort. I know how silly that sounds, but it's just a thing. Uh, and it, it doesn't, it's not with you. It's not, it doesn't react to you. Uh, uh, if you make a mistake in anything, maybe it'll do something, it goes ping, but it won't, you won't feel like, sometimes you might have to go backwards into a more human and cruder ways of doing things to, to pull in. You know, when you, you've had people who really aren't really good speakers, they're a little clumsy in their speech and they pause and, they sometimes lose their self. And in that silence, you're pulled in. And mm -hmm. things that don't work, you're pulled in. And it becomes more human, more real. I, I created, I, I have nothing to do with TED now, okay? Yep. I ran TED for 18 years. So the TED I'm talking about is somewhat different than what they do now. What they do now is huge, magnificent in its way, and is worldwide, global. The word billions also comes up often. I was thinking of the convergence of things that I was interested in 1983. I was seeing, talking to designers who were starting to use technology. I was talking to technologists who were starting to care about design. Uh, And the composite of that, when it drew you in, was entertaining. It was interesting. And I realized, wow, why don't they talk to each other? There's design conferences, and then there's technology conferences, and there's entertainment conferences. There's awards in each of those fields, and they don't talk to each other. They know, hesitantly, they are starting to use each other and looking at each other's business, but there was nothing that gave them permission or to say that they were doing that. So the first TED conference was just me saying technology, entertainment, design. I was really fat then. So I called it TED like a teddy bear. And uh, it was convergence of those three, the technology business, the entertainment industry, the design professions in the service of learning and communications. Well, I object, exactly to your, I object to your use of the word just that you just did that. Uh, one of the things that's remarkable about that and talking about our colleagues who are listening in, uh, at that time, to my knowledge, you couldn't go to a conference just started by somebody, that there needed to be imprimatur, there needed to be a department or an institute or a sanctioning body. You're still looking this way, look at me. <laughs> Why are you, what's over there? Why are you looking through that? That's side? where your video is on my screen because I have to look at the stuff too. <laughs> Move your chair or something. Okay, because I want to see you. See, there, I yes. relate to you when I look at you. <laughs> Am I looking over to some place? No. Okay. So. No, because Stefan knew how to set up your computer uh, correctly. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, but it makes our conversation better for me if I see you. And I don't see you looking over there. I think there's something I'm missing. <laughs> yes. I okay. wouldn't hold out on you, Richard. I, I promise you, I wouldn't hold out on you. 
Okay, I'll tell you all the things that were the opposite of Ted. Yes. Uh, first of all, um, there was no press passes. These are not in order of priority, I'm just thinking of things. Well, that's a common thing, you wanna get press. You wanna get press, you wanna have things written about you. And then I, I realized why. If you have good press of a conference, the next one's a year later. It's too late. <laughs> It's too, long. <laughs> it's too early to have the press. So you don't want any, I don't want any press. I don't care about press for a conference because you don't do it for a year. It's like having a press for a book you didn't write. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I didn't save seats for speakers. There was no hierarchy. Unless you were over 90 or crippled, you couldn't sit in the front row. I mean, I would save some seats for people who are over 90 or crippled but not for sponsors, not for speakers. I had, uh, I didn't have a lectern. So you're up there and your crotch was visible to the audience. Well, <laughs> when there's not a table between you, you're more vulnerable. So your speech hopefully is more vulnerable, but, but also the lectern is where you could put a speech and read it and you couldn't rehearse and you couldn't have a speech you read. And I didn't know what you were gonna speak about. I didn't censor you beforehand. I didn't rehearse you beforehand. There was no makeup artist. There was, I, I sold tickets. I didn't invite anybody to come but the speakers. Uh, there is this room around that was an invitation only conference. Absolutely not. It absolutely was whoever signed up got in and when we reached a number, it was like 10% over what sat in the room because I knew there's always people that were out peeing or out doing something. There was always 10% of the room not in there. So you could always find a seat. <laughs> I, sold, I sold that many seats and then I didn't sell any more seats and those seats were gone a year in advance. But I didn't invite people. And I had some heavy duty people who wanted to get in and I couldn't let in several, what they even called then billionaires in 84, not too many then in 84. So, and I wasn't connected with a university or a corporation, which is what you were talking about. Yeah. Nobody asked me to do it. Uh, and it was in a place where nobody knew anybody at that time, Monterey, nobody could leave the conference and have lunch with somebody because there was nobody to have lunch with. I mean, except two people who were at the conference. And, when I ran it, there was, I discouraged deeply any dinner parties or any breaking up, there was no cliques. Now we've heard of the billionaire's dinner lately because of the scandal, but I discouraged that. Ultimately it caught on with the billionaires. And I <laughs> like billionaires do. <laughs> check people, you know, change people's habits. Yeah. Uh, so you could say there's a picture of me at one. Yeah, I wanted to see what was happening, but I went back to the party for everybody. Everybody went to everything. There was no cliques that I know about. Um, and uh, you couldn't sell a book and you couldn't sell a charity. You couldn't sell something good or bad or your company or a product. You could just talk with us and have a conversation with the audience. And there was always a high level of light in the audience so you weren't blinded as a speaker. So and you could actually see who was out there. You could see who was out there. And you could call out the people out there. And I was on stage the whole time. So I, for 18 years, could see what was interesting to people and how they reacted. Uh, that has helped me a great deal in my life, the reading of faces uh, by sitting on the stage for three or four days and looking at that audience of rather astonishing people, not only the people who were going to speak, but people who could have be speakers, very high level audience. Yeah. And uh, that was a, an interesting learning experience for me. One of the questions from the audience from Karen is, how do you know when you're done with an idea? And is it fair for me to say that when you were working on TED, you were working on it the whole time until you were done with it, maybe even after you sold it. From uh, working on it, thinking about it, how to make it better standpoint? Well, there's several questions there. 
and several different answers. One question that people ask you, well, you know, I live in Florida now, well, do you miss living in, uh, in, in Newport, Rhode Island? I said, I miss Newport, I miss New York, I miss living in LA, I miss living in Philadelphia. I miss everything I've done. <laughs> everything I've done. It was interesting. I listened. I love I listened. that. Living in the jungle in Guatemala, living in St. Louis, living in LA. I miss <laughs> everything. Why wouldn't you miss everything? <laughs> what the question is that? It's a stupid question. <laughs> of course I miss it. Well, are, do you work on everything all the time? Of course you're thinking about things all the time. Are you thinking about all the everything 24-7 every second day? No. But when you're thinking of something, you're thinking of something. And then slowly it gets a little grayer and disappears. And you're not yeah. thinking, I'm not thinking about the opening of TED, which I thought about a lot, when they, you know, for the following year or something like that. So things get dim. But I, I'm thinking about things. I'm, I happen to be doing a, several pieces of, of sculpture now and, and bronze sculpture. So I'm thinking, I can't not think about how, what I'm yeah. going to do for the next one. And I have nobody to talk to, so all I can do is think about it. Uh, you know, I, I, I can't, it doesn't get generated because I, I live a very flat, lonely life. And that's just the nature of living in Florida, not liking people so much, and uh, being old. Well, and, one, thing, one thing you did, even when you were in Newport, that maybe would help Karen is uh, a tiny little story of me observing you with your painting where you had some frames, some empty frames stacked up, and then you did a bunch of paintings and then had them all sent off to be framed so that you could be done with them. Is there a, something about- Oh, absolutely. An effort oh, yeah. off like that to make yeah, it be done? Well, I, I have frames made now because I paint, as you know, I started painting again after dropping it for 15, 20 years, and then before that about 40 years. So uh, I come back to things. So I've stopped painting now and doing sculpture. But when I painted, I had a whole, I had, I bought a whole bunch of paper and when I was in Xi'an, China, at some nice rice paper, a big roll, pretty cut. So I got frames made that size, because I thought all oh, my paintings would then be that size, which they were. I didn't have to think about that. And then I always paint birds, so I don't have to think about what they're going to be. So I get that, rid of all of that. So I sit, and the subject of the painting is the painting, is how I paint on a very difficult surface that is absorbed of watercolors. So the challenge is, how do you paint on something that as soon as you touch it, spreads the paint? So how do you, how fast can you be? The kind of sumi thing, but then also use color. So that, that's other stuff. But then at a certain point, I look at it and I come back to it over a period of days. And I might do one more thing or one more thing. And then finally, I think, well, there's nothing more I feel like doing to it. I frame it. Uh, then I can't do anything more to it. Yep. The next thing I do is I have a lot of framed pictures and I keep on doing them and then I run out of space and frames. So I take those that I have and I have them stacked now and I take out the painting I don't like as much and put another one in. And then I throw away the other paintings. I don't sell my painting and I don't show my paintings. You've seen them. But I have, and it kills me that you throw them away when you run out of frames. Uh, but we can move on. Uh, uh, second question from, from Karen, it's about latch. And uh, there are some well, You notice that all you're talking about is rules. I have rules for myself. Yeah. It seems like yeah. I'm a loose cannon, but I live by rules. I live by a system of how within it I can do good work. Yeah, happy limitations, I believe you called them in information oh, anxiety. So uh, Donna Spencer is a uh, information architect in Australia and she teaches this stuff and wants to add task and audience as part of uh, that framework. What do you think about tasks and audience as additions to, or if they relate to your theory of latch? Uh, I don't think they relate, but if they relate to her, let her do it. She should do it. She should do it. <laughs> I don't, it's not a proprietary thing. I find that LATCH works for me for doing my work. Uh, the rigor of beginning. I think they would be subsets for me as chaos, the lack of organization you could have as a subset. People think that's the sixth, but they can. It doesn't matter to me. I'm not trying to preserve that so it's on my gravestone. 
it's it's just something that worked for me like a nose works for me for the five ways of innovation somebody comes up with a six that i think is phenomenal then i'll say there's six ways and I have to do a different word but if it's not useful to me just let them put it on and create a new word and make a career out of it i mean it's all fine with me i'm not trying to i don't want to walk down the street and have somebody following me i don't want to look around and see something it's sorry richard should do what they want to do no but they, people should do what they want to do i give everybody permission yeah I mean, my book understanding understanding if anybody has heard of it you can't get it in bookstores and it hasn't been reviewed. You can only get it on Amazon, and I'm not trying to sell it, but I'm just saying it won't be reprinted. All the whole book is, is wonderful people, buds of mine, my muses, showing how they understand something. What is understanding to them, obliquely or directly? And it shows you, you can understand things lots of different ways, not the way you're taught in school. So it's a permission-giving book. And that's what I'm telling you back as far as adding some letters to some corny latch or this or that. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, I'm just giving you permission. You know, have a life, have an interesting life. <laughs> that's uh, wonderful. The design problem is designing your life. Uh, the, some of the people on the call have never heard that there's a difference between a learning system and an education system. Well, and they should. They should do some work. I have a colleague in uh, Dallas, uh, Cassini Nazir, who uh, is a, a teacher. And so he would like to know, what are the, are there other systems involved between learning and education systems? And how are they different from each other? Well, that's not a bad question, but it's one that's difficult to answer. The educational system is, is, is our system occurs because people go to schools of education to learn to be a teacher. So they're already learning how to teach from a generation past, because their teachers are all at least a generation older than they are, or they vary, but they're older, you know, they've gone through something else. Yeah. And generally, they teach you what they had to be taught, what they were taught. When you, you referred to that as hazing, I believe. Yes, when you go, through, go to a fraternity, <laughs> you are beat up on or done. There's a whole series of hazing. Yes, is what I call it. It's the hazing system of, of our educational system. So they don't really want to have you walk naked through campus or eat a chicken or do all the things supposedly that fraternities and sororities do, but they do it because they had to do it. So it's passed down from generation to generation reading, writing, and arithmetic. I mean, it's all passed down. You have to take these subjects. You have to learn about uh, the Mesopotamian Valley or this, this history, this kind of, you learn about these things because that's what we did. That's what we had to do. That's what we were taught to do. And then we teach you that that's the right way to be an educated learner. That, that gets you through society. So our SAT tests and ACT tests are based on that's what you've taken. They're based on that is what learning is. That is what knowledge is. Uh, and it's not based on how we get knowledge today. When we look up something on Google, it's, it's, not, it's not going, it's different than going to a library. In a library, because most libraries are in open stacks. So in library, you have to know what you want before you get it. Because you have to get to the book. You have to ask for a book. Or you have to do it by their Dewey Decimal System that's another system where somebody broke it into a, a lot of letters. It was longer than the latch, right? So take, oh, well, take my book, for instance, Understanding Understanding. They wouldn't know where to put that in the library because it's not on a subject, a specific subject. Somebody once wrote that a dictionary is a poem about everything. <laughs> and in a sense, that's my book is a, a book about everything. Um, open stacks, you go to open stacks, that's different. Then you start, you find, you take home the book that's down the shelf from the one you were looking at and you didn't even never heard of it or didn't know you'd be interested, didn't know anybody did it. And you look down and you're sort of browsing around an, a world that has some 
centroid of the thing you were going to, the centroid of what you were going for is there, but it's free out there. You didn't invent it or think of it, it just comes to you. It tracks. So getting that one item, that's the education system. Seeing the interplay of the topics is, is a, more of a learning system. The learning system. system is based on, I give you permission, if you're interested in cars, which a lot of 16 year old people are. I use it as a good example because a lot of 16 year old people are interested in cars. I'm not taking that as a prime example, mm -hmm. but it's easy, easy to see that cars relate to uh, road systems and mapping. Uh, they relate to speed and physics, chemistry of how they work, whether they're electric cars or combustion engines or steam engines, uh, design, materials, fabrics, different countries, colors, it just you can go size of household size of incomes the cost the thing this what the, what what the energy systems are i mean yeah. the development of energy everything connects but it comes from you then i'm interested in cars and my guide shows me this how it connects to the world this open stack this one word car in one row of shelves of books takes me through the whole library yeah that's a learning system. Well, and that's um, has a course in your third year called cars. <laughs> and that's right. it. Then you go on to learning about glaciers. <laughs> so Liz Hubert, uh, another information architect that I know out there in the world. Uh, the last quarter of the talk now, we're in the last quarter. We start yeah, last quarter. yeah, no, this is going really fast, Richard. So Liz oh, says uh, she would love to go backwards also but natural selection, it feels like natural selection is a thing in how we make technology products and services. And the arrow of evolution of natural selection is, has given us this crap that we have now. So do you have any ideas about how to change the course? My Fair Lady, that, that movie and the show, towards the end, he has transformed this cockney girl uh, who was selling buttons or something. And, in the market and he's taken a bet and he, he could transform her by changing her, her, her habits, her, her way of holding herself and particularly her language and how she spoke. And, but she couldn't change the fact that she was a young girl and she had a mind of her own and thought in different ways and didn't solve problems, didn't react the way he wanted her to react about what he felt was ideal, kind of a very Great Britain centric idea, right? Mm -hmm. English idea. So I don't want everybody to be like me. I want the opposite. He says, famous at the end of that, why can't everybody be like me? I'm not saying that to you. I don't want everybody to think in opposites or backwards or everybody to learn the way I learn or be as interested in things or everybody do conferences, or everybody do books or everybody to have a broad, shallow life like mine or everybody to be abrasive and charming. I don't want anybody to be like me. I am not yeah. teaching this. I'm not trying to change people. I'm just saying, you have me on here to speak. I'm talking about what I do, but I'm not trying to tell you you should do it. So I'm not saying everybody out there that hears my voice should now go into a learning system and throw away everything you have. It's going to go on. Everything that we're doing is going to go on. I said that in the beginning, that we can make modest improvements to things and go through a very happy life that way. It's very nice one year to make $50,000 and next year make 55,000, next year to make 60,000. Improvement of things is fine. Going, doing things better is fine. Making, learning how to knit better a little bit incrementally is fine. But there's other directions you could go. Instead of knitting, you could learn about 3D printing or something else or go naked or whatever. There's other things you could do. My partner across the screen is reading questions. No, I am, and one that I just I'm read. Your eyes. I'm watching your eyes. One that I just read that I'm fascinated by is. Uh, I don't want to see the questions. I don't want to see them. Uh, no, this is, this is just a poll uh, that the other people are, are getting. I don't have my glasses on, so I can't read it. Take it away. Take it away. Yeah, I think you have to click on something to make it go away if Stefan is still there. Uh, maybe last question then before the organizers uh, have to do their uh, raffle and some other things, which would be you said at the top. We complain about traffic, and then here we are, we're in the car. Does that, 
Do you think that that's true of global warming? And how do we, as designers, as people who want to make it better, not worse, what do we do with this? Well, since I can't see your face anymore, <laughs> oh God! I have to get rid of that white thing in the middle of my screen, or I have to put my glasses on. Okay, now you can. Well, I was trying to look handsome. <laughs> Okay, Richard Soerman, you can't get there. Host panel can't vote. Oh, it's voting. I don't want to vote. Yeah, you might just have to click the X. Webinar, meet your, you're taking a vote on whether meet your ex host can't vote. So get rid of it. I can't, there it is. They got rid of it. Now my glasses are Okay. I hope they can keep this up so we can talk because I would like to have some things I want to talk to you about. Uh, I'll call you on, a, on another line. The important thing here is I'm just telling you about how I go about things. I'm giving you permission to go about them what feels natural to you. I'm, I'm, I'm also talking about making mistakes, failure. I have done so many things that have failed. You know, I have things that I think are bright ideas and they don't work. Or I've done whole books. Yeah. Thought, well, I've done the book. Why print it? <laughs> Why bother? I then have 110 books. You've seen the books I've finished or I've had in drawers. I've done them. Yep. That's enough for me. I'm satisfied with doing it. Sometimes the satisfaction doesn't come till I do print it and see how it looks. But sometimes I'm satisfied by just doing it. Uh, I know that's not the rules. So I'm not telling you to do it that way. I'm just trying to tell you a story of my life, which is what I thought this was about, of answering <laughs> your questions honestly. But no, not a it. it's not a lecture trying to change people's habits. Global warming you brought up. What is the question? Is there global warming? Most people think there is, and statistically they think it is. And some people deny that there is any, and other people think it's a combination of natural huge patterns and waves of change and things that man has done. My opinion first is that obviously we're putting our garbage in our bedroom. We're polluting everything, which in itself, independent of warming or cooling, we shouldn't do. There's also problems and issues that it could be global cooling. That killed off, that'll kill people off quicker than global warming, actually. And we could go into global cooling, which could be the result of global warming. But that's not my field of expertise. And I am not going to make that my life's work. And I'm happy that some people are making it their life's work of trying to find causes, cleaning up oceans and cleaning up the trash. I think that's terrific. It's well, it also sounds like you're willing to, to, the answer, the short answer might be yes, that we are global, just like we are traffic, we I are. Am, yes. Yeah. I am global warming. Yeah. Everybody is global warming. Yeah. You've also said you're a zoo, but uh, we'll talk about that another day. Well, I'm a zoo because, because most of my cells are not what you call human cells. Most of the trillions of cells, and there's wide discrepancy between one trillion and a hundred trillion cells that you have in your body. A trillion is a number you can't understand, let alone more than one trillion. Uh, that most of your cells, 90 some percent of them, more than 90 percent, are not human cells. They're different animals, separate animals that have a life of their own, single, more than single cell creatures. There's all kinds of things, and we'd be dead without them. Nematodes. All kinds of stuff. So yes. we're, we're actually a zoo. And I think that's a great way to uh, let Laura back in to close this thing off is uh, look at us, these uh, zoos that we are. And we're global warming and we it's are trying. long enough for you and I to have this conversation to see that. We didn't touch on anything. Okay. And I hate to even slow this down. I'd be more than happy to have you continue with this uh, really fantastic conversation. And now I'm starting to look at myself and go, I wonder which animals I'm strongly connected to, so it's time for me to do my DNA. Uh, Richard, thank you so much. Dan, thank you guys so much. We're gonna do some business and just announce uh, some uh, raffle winners, which I know isn't the most sexy, fun thing to do, but we have uh, th three winners and all of you will be reached out to 
uh, via uh, email, but we've got a winner of uh, the book Mortality, Nicole Copeland, and we have three winners for the Polar Bear book, Information Architecture for the Web and Beyond, fourth edition, Art Kellner, Melissa Yang, and Sean Slattery. Congratulations, everyone. Uh, thank you all so very much. We're so glad you could make it. We're so honored that Mr. Worman and Dan could be here and have this fabulous, fascinating conversation. Um, and until next time, we'll have another one in January. We hope everyone has a wonderful day. And thank you so much for being here with us here at Vivid Resources and Vivid Voices. Thanks, Laura. Thank you, Richard. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Mr. You Worman. Thanks, Dan. Bye.